Um, uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here after this uh, wonderful gala dinner we just had. So. <laughs> Very brave of you. My name is Lorena uh, Abad. I'm from the Department of Geoinformatics at the University of Salzburg, and I'm here to present to you some work of our uh, one of our projects called Slide DEM. And um, I'm here on behalf also of my co-authors Daniel Hebling, Sara Davidi, and Benjamin Robson from the University of Norway. So um, let's get started quickly with a bit of background, just to have a sense. Um, uh, do any of you work with SAR data, so radar data? Yeah, some? Okay, so I will just give a little intro of um, the very basics uh, for myself as well, because I'm not usually working with SAR data. So the idea here is that radar is penetrating the Earth and getting information every time um, ray uh, goes into the Earth and bounces back. The idea here is that if we have two satellites, one in time one and one in time two, orbiting the air, we can get some information of the topography of the Earth's surface because we have two points in time with an angle that will give us this information. Then um, with this information, we have these two satellites, they go at different times. We have a perpendicular baseline, which is something that I'm going to just be throwing the term in here and there. And we have the temporal baseline, which is the difference uh, in time, time one, time two. And the perpendicular di baseline is the, the distance between the two satellites. The idea here is that um, because we're having these satellites orbiting the air, we can get information about the topography of the Earth. If uh, there is no change between two points in time uh, in when the satellites are orbiting, it means that we can get some information about the topography, the real topography of the Earth. That means the elevation of the Earth. If there is um, any change between point one and point two, then we're going to get information about the changes that are happening. An example of this is, for, exa uh, for example, when you have volcanic activity, this is very um, used to check, okay, how much uh, difference has it been from the state of uh, before volcanic activity and after volcanic activity, how much has it moved, uh, or earthquakes, etc. But uh, actually for our um, purpose of doing uh, digital elevation models and to get topographic data, this is the situation that we don't want to get to. We want to get to a situation where uh, point one and point two are stable enough so that we can get the information of the elevation and topography of the Earth. And therefore we want that this time one and time two is as small as possible, that we get these two, these two passes um, really close in time so that the information is not changing so much. So I hope this was a quick intro to SAR data and there, therefore I will show you what we want to do with it. So the project itself is simple. We uh, want to start with a landslide event because we're working with lights, landslides at the Risk Hazard and Climate Lab. And what we want to know is, okay, from this landslide event, can I get digital elevation models from these two passes of Sentinel-1? So for that, the idea is, okay, we collect the data, we check for their suitability, uh, we generate a DM with this information, we uh, compute uh, the landslide uh, volume estimation because we can get a DM before the event, we can get a DM after the event. Um, in parallel, we will do some DM accuracy assessment to see how good it is, and we will do some value estimation uh, validation to see how good this is. So the idea is simple, and what we wanted to do is do a conceptual, uh, conceptual framework and a workflow that would allow us to do this systematic analysis of these elevation models that we are generating. Um, for that, we chose several events and study areas for the workflow evaluation. So we have a landslide in Kreknes Alta in Norway. Um, probably you saw uh, in the news about it. Some houses went away. It's really in the north. We have a quick clay, quick clay landslide in Gerdrum, uh, Norway, which was in uh, Christmas 2020, uh, which was also quite fatal. And we have a rockfall in Hutschler Girls, Austria, which did not have any fatalities, but it is quite big that we thought this could be a good event and study area for the workflow evaluation. So this is the idea that we had, okay, we want to do this, but now how do we technically implement this? So don't get overwhelmed. This is just a very simplified workflow of what happened, but I will show you with more examples. Um, but very simply, it's just a translation of what I showed previously. So you have Sentinel-1 image pairs. We want to 
query them, we want to get them, these two image pairs that are close in time, right? Then we want to download these uh, selected pairs. We want to generate the EMs out of it, and for that we use Snap. If uh, you work with Sentinel-1, you're probably very familiar with Snap. Um, we want to co-register and assess their quality, because um, if you've ever tried to do a DEM with Sentinel-1 data, you will know that the quality is not the best. So the idea here is to get it at least to a decent level so that we can do baseline comparisons. And then we want to estimate the volume change. So here I've just put some of the key places where we, the key players of the workflow. So we query from the Alaska uh, facility server. We uh, use Snap, and here we use uh, some information also from Open Topography to get uh, reference data to do our core registration and assess the quality. And then the volume change would be a difference, a DM of difference between the two points in time. So uh, what I did here is implement everything um, with Python. So uh, with the Snap uh, API for Python. And the idea is that you can clone this repository and um, pull this Docker image to be able to run this workflow. Now, why did I use Docker in this case? If you've ever worked with Snap, let's go again for that, you will know that it is a little bit of a mess to have all the dependencies on point, to use it between platforms, Linux, Windows, it's a complete mess. Um, you will need to do some updates, some uh, many things that Imp that have a lot of hassle in doing the implementation. So I actually have my coworker who is normally working with SAR data, and I remember her spending one or two weeks just setting up the workflow in a in a workstation to be able to process the SAR imagery. So then I thought, okay, uh, this is not good. We need to dockerize this. We need to put this everything in one single compartment that will allow us to just run everything in one single place. We don't need to be thinking about all this software. So this is why I dockerized it. How did I do it? It's uh, based on the Mundialis uh, is a Snap image. Uh, it's currently running with Snap 8 because Snap 9 just was released. So I did not want to touch anything or break anything before this presentation, but I, will prom I promise I will update it soon. Uh, I compile it via GitHub Actions because I discovered that our university server had some problems with uh, doing updates from Snap, so I couldn't uh, compile all this Docker image in there. So um, this is also something that you can get around. So just call it from Docker Hub. And uh, what I, well, the work, way we're working is mounting a local uh, volume to write our results. That means we can connect to our own computer to write the results to disk and nothing stays in the Docker or the virtual machine, if that's a better way to uh, understand what a Docker container is. And um, I wrote a series of scripts uh, that you can pass arguments to in the command line to uh, be able to run this. So now let's go to with a practical example so that this gets a little bit less abstract and more applied. And this is one of the landslides that I was talking about. This is in Gerdrum, uh, Norway. As you see, many houses went out. Uh, it's quite big in extent, so we thought it would be an interesting uh, place to look into. And uh, the topography is not as steep. It's a bit um, hilly, but not high mountains. Um, but we have also other test areas where there are high mountains, where there's more vegetation, just to see what exactly is going on and what are the best parameters uh, to generate these DMs. So just a bit more context, uh, the event was in the 30th of December 2020. Uh, there were some minor events after that. Uh, Ten people lost their lives, several buildings were destroyed, several people evacuated, and then more to the data itself, it had a detachment area of uh, 0 0.12 square kilometers, an outlet area of 0 0.26 square kilometers, 1.35 million cubic meters were mobilized, and uh, almost 1 million cubic meter was also uh, deposited. The study area is here in Gerdrum, Norway, and closer to Oslo. And uh, this is one of the uh, images that my coworker got when he went to the site to take a look at what was happening. This is a bit of a um, aerial uh, view of what uh, was the before and after. Luckily, because this was a big event, we have a lot of uh, data where we can uh, check what was going on. A lot of UAV imagery, so like reference data to see what uh, how good our DMs are getting. 
And uh, we have here the elevation difference. So uh, what was detached, what went out of the landslide, and here the deposition, what was um, yeah, deposited after the event. So let's go step by step on how this workflow will work. Um, step one, before having the workflow, would be to query data. If you've ever queried data from the Alaska facility, you will be familiar with these screens. So first, what you do is draw an AOI, and then you get a bunch of images in this area here that correspond to the, to the area that you're looking into. Once you've done, you're done with that, this can also be by temporal uh, search, just uh, narrow down. Once you've done with that, you will have to do a baseline search, meaning that uh, for every image that you found, you will need to find a pair that is uh, compatible with, um, with the image that you selected so that you can do this uh, double pass with the imagery. So having a small temporal baseline, a good perpendicular baseline, and that they are both in the same orbit, that they're both in the same path, so um, that they have these characteristics needed to do interferometrics R. So this is how you would do it normally. And this is what we did to um, improve the workflow. In what way? If you would do this manually, you would have, for example, for this example here, we have the AOI, we have um, two months. So we start in uh, July, 1st of July, and we end on the 31st of August. And if you do this uh, manually, you will get 59 geographic matches. So you would have 59 images. For each image, you will have an average of 355 images that you have to look into if they match or don't match. That means you will have to look into 20,986 matches. And then from there, you would have to um, filter how many you really want. In this case, it's 86. So with this uh, first step, uh, I simplify this in a way that this will all be done in the background because I query the uh, Alaska uh, API where you will just get a list of your reference ID, your match ID, the orbit, the path, and a temporal baseline, perpendicular baseline, reference dates, everything that you need. You don't need to spend all this time querying for the data. That's the bottom line. That's what also my coworker was taking weeks to do. Now she's very happy. She can just run it once, get the CSV, and see what's going on. What I added also is um, a URL to the EO browser of Sentinel Hub so that you can take a look at how it looked exactly in, around these dates in uh, optical imagery so that you see, OK, actually, there was snow on these dates. So it's not so useful for me to do interferometrics R because there will be too much interference with my uh, final workflow. Or there was a lot of clouds. Maybe it was raining too much. Maybe the atmospheric uh, is not going to be the optimal to do my uh, interferometrics R. So you can also choose here. Um, from here, you can take a look at how it's, everything is going. Then you download, and that's very simple. You just have the CSV, and I put here a column that where you, as an analyst, will have to change from false to true. And with that, you just pass this to the next um, script, saying, OK, everything that is true, please download it. It will take time. Sadly, we have to download the whole image, because otherwise, um, Snap will not be able to process this. It is um, a bit of a quirk, but OK. That's what we need to deal with. And if you have a server, this will go much better in the uh, uh, batch download. And uh, step number three is generating the DMs. This is how, let's call it, uh, you would normally do it. This is the interface of Snap. It's, um, yeah, I'm not so used to it. I don't really like it. I don't know how to do all the visualizations and check everything. But this is somehow how it looks like. And um, just. I will not go through all of this, but this is every single step that you need to do to get a, a DEM out of it. So it's quite long. Um, it's divided in three pipelines because this can all be done in one go, but then you need to get out of this snap environment to another software to do this uh, very specific um, uh, phase unwrapping. And then you need to go back to snap and finish uh, your last steps, which would be um, doing this uh, DM terrain correction, et cetera. So the idea here is that everything was bundled into one script. So the next one that would go, um, you can give 
a lot of uh, parameters that you would normally give to Snap. You can give them to the script, and so that you don't get lost into, okay, what did I set here? What did I didn't set here? I created a log file where you will have all the information of, okay, what did I set? What were the parameters that were computing, computed inside? So like the subset, the uh, burst, the swats. Um, we have a lot of parameters for each pipeline, and we have some information that is also computed during the process. Um, as you see here as well, you have some outputs already. Uh, just to give you an idea, um, my coworker would spend like at least three days generating a DEM. Now this is done in half an hour. Um, so it's uh, quite useful. And uh, we also have these intermediate steps because it's very important when you're doing a DEM to look at the intermediate products and see, okay, is this really working well or not? Is the interferogram making any sense or not? Do we have any errors or not? So this is how the products look like. We get elevation, we get the coherence, which is how uh, matching are the two images, so to see how good the elevation values would be on each of the areas. So higher areas means there is a better match between the, the um, two images. As you can see, this is not a great match, but this is uh, one of the examples that I chose during this. And you can also uh, have an elevation filter by a coherence threshold if you think this, this uh, coherence is just um, too low, you can just get rid of this. And uh, we have intensity, the phase, and the unwrap phase. Finally, uh, thank you, <laughs> we have step four, which is assessing the quality. And the idea here, I added a, another little script where you can get some reference data. So that this is what the, where the open topography enters. Uh, you can download the NASA DM or any DM that is available for your area. And also the ESA world cover where you can do some analysis by uh, land use land cover and to see, okay, where is my DM per elevation performing better or not. And uh, I use for this this very good package called XDM. So if you have uh, also working with DM data, I recommend you looking into it. Um, I would recommend you do your own uh, quality assessment using this package. But because I'm, we're, we're trying to do this in several steps in a um, 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 organized way where we generate several DMs and assess them all in a, in a row, that's why there's a module for doing a quality assessment. And this um, little bit of a hint of what you can get out of it. So for example, we have the reference DM. In this case, it's the NASA DM. This is the Sentinel-1 DM. So you can see it is very um, patchy. It's not super beautiful. But OK, this is one of the things that we get. And what we do is uh, get an elevation difference to see, OK, where are these values performing better or not. So as you see, this area is quite bad. But the area that we're really interested in is the landslide. So this is what we focus on. It's still bad, but not as bad as the other er uh, areas around. And as you see, you can get some information about how um, uh, the qualities, the error, how it's changing according to the slope. So higher slopes have higher errors as normal, because then the angles are ha uh, harder to compute. Uh, we also have some information about how it uh, varies with the aspect. And because we included some land use land cover data, we can also see, okay, uh, with grassland and cropland apparently is doing okay, but with tree cover and shrubland, we have a bit more problems. And um, just to get a general idea, I've also included these terrain derivatives where you can have a quick look of how it would look like if you're really working with this DM. So just for comparison here, this is the NASA DM, so a bit nicer. This is the Sentinel-1 DM, very noisy, but still um, you can get a general idea of what you're working with. And uh, of course, the vertical co-registration, as I said, if we have a reference DM, we can see, OK, how is this looking? Is this looking good or not? Uh, some statistics that you can get as well to see, okay, how is the error good or not? And finally, calculating volume. So if you have a pre-event and a post-event, you can see, okay, what was the volume that was uh, uh, changing between these two timestamps? And you have the elevation difference and some of the numbers that you get that here we can compute. This is really an overestimation of, uh, of this particular event. But alas, uh, this is also meant to do a systematic analysis of all the DMs that we want to compute for this area. So as a conclusion, um, we aim to develop an open source, low cost, transferable, 
semi-automatic method because you need to set which one to download um, for DM generation and lastly volume estimation. Um, we looked into several study areas to test implementation, identify input parameters, detect bugs, improve performance, assess the usability, how good this is uh, really for long term. Um, we think that disaster risk management can benefit greatly from this because you just don't have all the technical hassle, but really can focus on the analysis. And we think it is really useful to also tackle some scientific questions regarding the valid validity of your data uh, for all these geomorphological analysis. So we hope that this is useful. And um, yes, this is it for my presentation. Please feel free to go to the GitHub repository and take a look at what we've done. I'm working on the documentation, so if you have any uh, input on that, please feel welcome. Thank you very much.